This is Apollo, the Greek and Roman god of sunlight, prophecy, music, and poetry. He's usually painted or pictured in the sky with other Greek gods, and as a result, his name was chosen to represent one of the most ambitious space programs of the late 1960s, the Apollo program. The Apollo program, also known as Project Apollo, was established by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It had the expressed goal to put the first humans on the moon. The Apollo program had 17 total flights. Apollo 11 was the first flight that was successful at putting humans on the moon, and Apollo 1 and Apollo 13 were the only two flights that resulted in failure. And unfortunately, Apollo 1 is the only flight that had human casualties. This picture is of the crew of Apollo 1. Starting from the left is Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger B. Chaff. Virgil Ivan Gus Grissom was born April 3rd of 1926. He was a United States Air Force pilot and a World War II and Korean War veteran. Gus Grissom would go on to join NASA in 1959 when he received an official teletype message instructing him to report to an address in Washington, D.C. He was ordered to join the Mercury 7 and become one of the first Americans in outer space. After that flight, he was then transferred to the Apollo program, and he was assigned the role of commander. Edward Higgins White II was born November 14, 1930. He was an aeronautical engineer for the United States Air Force and a test pilot. After graduating from West Point in 1952 with a Bachelor of Science, Edward was transferred to the Bitburg Air Base in West Germany, where he flew the F-86 Sabre and F-100 Super Sabre. His talent for flying didn't go unnoticed, and NASA reached out to him and selected him to be one of the second group of astronauts, so-called the Next Nine, who were chosen to take part of the Gemini and Apollo missions. On June 3, 1965, Edward became the first American to walk in space. After that, he was quickly assigned as senior pilot of Apollo 1. Robert B. Chaff was born February 15, 1935. He was a naval officer, aviator, and aeronautical engineer. He began his pilot training at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. He flew a T-34, T-28, and A-3D. Like Edward, his talent for flying was recognized by NASA, and he was chosen out of a group of 13 other pilots like him to become the third member of the flight crew of Apollo 1. Apollo 1 never officially left the Earth's atmosphere. The Apollo 1 capsule wasn't ready yet, it was still being tested. This is because the Apollo Command and Service Module was much bigger and far more complex than any previously implemented spacecraft design that NASA had come up with. At 1 p.m. on Friday, January 27th of 1967, astronauts Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chaff entered the spacecraft. The plan that day was to perform a plugs-out test. This test was meant to determine whether or not the spacecraft was able to function without additional external power. If the spacecraft were to fail this test, all life support technology within the spacecraft would fail as well. The test was considered non-hazardous because neither the launch vehicle nor the spacecraft was loaded with fuel or cryogenics or any pyrotechnic systems, and at 1 p.m. EST, they began the test. After the Apollo 1 flight crew sat inside the capsule, the door shut and the capsule pressurized. After sealing the door, Gus Grissom immediately noticed a strange odor in the air circulating through his suit, which he compared to sour buttermilk. After reporting this odor, the simulated countdown was paused. Air samples were taken immediately, and nothing was found. Three minutes after the test, the countdown was resumed. The hatch installation was started, and the hatch consisted of three parts. A removable inner hatch, which stayed inside of the cabin, a hinged outer hatch, which was the part of the spacecraft's heat shield, and an outer hatch cover. This is important to note because during the accident, it was relatively difficult to open the door and attempt to rescue the astronauts inside. When the doors finally sealed, oxygen pressurized the inside of the capsule. The max pressure inside of the capsule was at 16 pounds per square inch, two pounds more than normal atmospheric pressure. And keep in mind that the cabin wasn't being pressurized with an oxygen-nitrogen mix. It was pure oxygen. While the capsule was sealed, the astronauts inside were performing various different tests to make sure that every single function with inside the capsule was running, especially because there was no external power. During this time, communication between the astronauts and the operations building were scarce, but all internal conversations of the astronauts were captured very clear. In this next portion of the video, I will be sharing some of the audio of this event. It is distressing to hear, and if you do not want to hear it, 
feel free to choose any other video that is recommended in the top right hand corner of the video right now. I'll be using a clip from Darklight753. His video was expertly transcribed and includes some of the cleanest audio of this event that I could find. If you want to listen to the entire audio, it will be linked in the description along with my other sources. Hey, how are we gonna get the moon? We can't talk between three buildings. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Jesus Christ. Again? But how are we gonna get the moon? We can't talk between two or three buildings. Before the fire, the crew members were using time to run through their checklist. This is the moment when Gus Grissom acknowledges that AC Bus 2 caught fire, and that's when he begins to shout. Gus Grissom begins to describe where the fire is and how big it is, and his other flight crew members begin to shout that they want to get out. The mic cuts out in 5 seconds, but the fire only lasted for 5. It took an additional 90 minutes to open the hatch and recover the bodies of the Apollo 1 flight crew. After the spark from AC Bus 2, Flames and gases then rushed outside of the command module. The fire and superheated gases exited through open access panels. The intense heat and dense smoke prevented anyone from attempting to rescue the crew members. And during the confusion, there were fears that the command module had exploded, or soon would, and that the fire might ignite the solid fuel rocket in the launch escape tower above the command module which would have likely killed nearby ground personnel and possibly have destroyed the pad. During the fire, pressure was released by the cabin rupture. Air immediately rushed into the cabin and the flames grew even larger. At this point, most of the oxygen inside of the cabin was consumed, and now the flames were mostly consuming atmospheric oxygen. As the smoke cleared, they found the bodies, but they were not able to remove them. The fire had partly melted Grissom's and White's nylon spacesuits, and the hoses connected them to the life support system. Grissom had removed his restraints and was lying on the floor of the spacecraft. White's restraints were burned through and he was found lying sideways just below the hatch. It was determined that he had tried to open the hatch per the emergency procedure, but was not able to do so against the internal pressure. Chaff was found strapped into his right hand seat, as procedure called for him to maintain communication until White opened the hatch. Because of the large strands of nylon fusing the astronauts to the interior of the cabin, removal and recovery of the bodies took nearly 90 minutes. The first NASA official to examine the interior of the spacecraft was Deke Slayton, and he had this to say. It was very difficult for me to determine the exact relationships of these two bodies. They were sort of jumbled together, and I couldn't really tell which head even belonged to which body at that point. I guess the only thing that was real obvious is that both bodies were at the lower edge of the hatch. They were not in the seats. They were almost completely clear of the seat areas. There are images of the three bodies immediately after they were removed from the capsule. Their bodies were basically reduced to carbon. The oxygen fire was so hot that the bodies of the three crew members fused to the insides of their suits. It's common speculation that most likely the three flight crew members were buried in their spacesuits, but there is no information to confirm this. There was an autopsy though, and it was determined that Grissom suffered third degree burns over one third of his body and his spacesuit was mostly destroyed. White suffered third degree burns on almost half of his body, and a quarter of his spacesuit had melted away. Chaff suffered third degree burns over almost a quarter of his body, and a small portion of his spacesuit was damaged. The autopsy report determined that the primary cause of death for all three astronauts was cardiac arrest caused by high concentrations of carbon monoxide. Burns suffered by the crew were not believed to be major factors, and it was concluded that most of them had occurred post-mortem. Asphyxiation occurred after the fire melted the astronauts' suits and oxygen tubes, exposing them to the lethal atmosphere of the cabin. Quickly after the autopsy, a major investigation was done to see what happened. 
it was concluded that the most likely cause was a spark from a short circuit in a bundle of wires that ran just to the left of Grissom's seat. The large amount of flammable material in the cabin in the oxygen-rich environment allowed the fire to start and spread quickly. The ignition source was just a bundle of cables that was stripped of its Teflon insulation. That, coupled with a pure oxygen atmosphere, just led to destruction. Fortunately, a number of changes were instituted into the Apollo program over the next year and a half, including designing a new hatch which opened outward and could be operated quickly, removing much of the flammable material and replacing it with self-extinguishing components, and implementing a nitrogen-oxygen mixture at launch. A lot of historians and researchers point to this moment as being pinnacle for American space development. This tragedy was inevitable, and we had to learn from it, and ironically enough, the gruesome loss of life has led to the preservation of hundreds of others. What's up everybody, it's your boy Aileris aka Panda Daddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you did, let me know in the comments down below, and leave a like if you liked the video. And if you're new to my channel, go ahead and subscribe fam, what you doing watching videos and not subscribing. And if you're old, make sure you hit that bell so you get these notifications every time. This Morbid Reality special will be followed by another one coming out on Wednesday, and a regular Morbid Reality episode coming out on Friday. If you have any stories that you want me to cover on Wednesday, let me know in the comments down below. And if you have any posts that you want me to cover on the Friday episode, also let me know in the comments down below. I wouldn't be able to make content like this without my Patreon supporters, so a big thank you to Ashleep, Queen Kajina, Tazluth, A Generic Fox Fur, Drago Scuffy, Soup, Viva LaRue, Witty Username, I Didn't Bought My Viewers True, Benny's Big Bean Burrito, Danny Wanny Has a Big Fanny, Spunky Funky Monkey Chucky Chunky, Tinky Winky Nobby Wobby, Upanut, D4C, My Name Tani, Kiri the Sloth, Lady Laughs A Lot, Mina the Swift, Esau, Destroyer, Muffy Lou Who, Noah, Vermont, John Robinson, Eva, Catherine Taylor, Hannah, and Will Billy. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my Patreon and one of my merch store. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.